Okay, we're moving to Android uh, with uh, Alexander and Raman. You have the floor. Take, take the mic, please, maybe you're... Hello. We are glad and proud to welcome all of you to our presentation today, dedicated to what we call Eastern Asian Android Assault, the malware flu horse. This malware mimics several widespread applications in Eastern Asian region, but the main highlight about it is how it manages to evade the detection and the analysis, both from researchers and sandboxes. Before we start the actual conversation, let me introduce the ones who are responsible for this research. My teammate name is Alex, and my name is Raman. We both are malware researchers in Checkpoint, and you can see the results of our work in the form of this presentation. So the plan for this talk is the following. First, we start with an overview of how we get the initial lead, speak about the infection chain, and make an overview of the malware from the high level, and also we discuss the attack scheme. And then the scenes are getting more technical when we discuss the framework behind the malware development and speak about the complications of its analysis, look at our approach to reverse engineering, and also discuss how it later led to the open source contribution. So we got the chance to lay our hands on this malware by spotting several emails that were sent to multiple recipients in Eastern Asian region, abusing different topics, and here you can see the translation of the email abusing the topic of electronic toll payment. What is interesting about this email is the inclusion of the malicious site and the proposal to download the application allegedly for this electronic toll payment, but in fact, it of course was malicious. And speaking about the site itself, please take a look at how similar it looks in comparison to the real site. So basically the same letters, but with just a slight twist. Speaking about the targets, we spotted multiple instances of high profile entities among the recipients. And we redacted the first parts of these email addresses because they are not supposed to be shared in the web or um, uh, search for and the inclusion in the recipient's list means that the attackers somehow got the hang on this data, potentially threatening the compromise not only the data of individuals, but of the organizations as well. And the first email address comes from Taiwanese country administration, the other one from the sports and medical supplies company, so pretty big organizations. When we actually managed to obtain the samples spread via the links, we were, to say the least, surprised because there were quite a few red flags like the initial spam emails, the malicious sites, and yet we saw this picture. So it was just one detection across several samples, and it was not the situation that the samples were just submitted to VirusTotal. In fact, they were present there for several months already, and yet managed to stay under the radars of security solutions. So we wondered what's inside. So we started to investigate, and the first scene we discovered were several graphical forms across different applications that mimicked this popular software spread in Eastern Asian region. And each of these mimicked applications feature more than 100,000 installs, and in fact, two of them featured even more, more than one million installs. And as you can see here, the attackers made a clever selection of various countries and various spheres to spread the infection as much as possible among the existing and also potential new customers of this software. Of course, these forms would be useless without the actual attack scheme, and so here it goes. It all starts with the malware installed as an APK on the compromised device. And then the victim is asked to input credentials and in certain cases for credit card details as well. After that, the form is shown to us that asks to wait for several minutes while the data is being processed. And here is the question. Now the attackers have their credentials. They have credit card details. What else do they need to actually make the full compromise, full usage of this data? Of course, all of you in the audience know the answer, and it is two-factor codes. And this is where the background function of the malware comes into play in the form of SMS monitoring and interception. So while the victim is waiting, if the attackers want to make use of this data and they ever require two-factor code, it is transmitted directly to their devices along with all the information that mm, may be received via the SMS. Here is the example of the malicious electronic toll collection forms. The first one asks for credentials, another one for credit card data, and then the proposal to wait for 10 minutes is shown. 
So at this step, if you wonder if there is a chance for the victims to actually evade the future compromise of the data, here is the comparison of the original and the malicious interfaces. The differences are quite subtle, and still the victim can think of something like maybe they made an update to the original interface if they're familiar with it. If they are not familiar, it looks, well, pretty believable. So if they don't have this handy slide in front of their devices, they risk the compromise of uh, the data anyway. Another example includes Vietnamese online banking uh, malicious application. In this case, only the credentials are asked to be input because credit card details are present inside the banking account anyway, so that the attackers do not need them at this stage and can use only the credentials. The differences between the original and the malicious interfaces are much more significant in this case, but again, even if the victim is familiar with the original interface, he or she may think, well, this looks pretty believable, so the logo is there, the background is there, forms do not look very weird, so it's pretty safe to input the data and risk and compromise my data. At this step, we're still not sure how the malware managed to stay under the radars of security solutions, so we wondered, maybe it's packed with evasions, maybe it features complex code obfuscation, or does it have long delays before the execution to full sandboxes as well? And if you're on the pessimistic side like we were and choose no to all three questions, then you're 100% right because that was the exact approach chosen by the attackers. In fact, they thought, why should we bother by implementing these complex techniques when one for all solution is ready and it comes even as an open source framework from Google and not on purpose, but this framework poses all kinds of difficulties and complications for the analysis both from researchers and sandboxes. So this is where the story of how malware was actually developed starts, and I'm handing the stage at the microphone to Alex. Okay, thanks, Roman. <clears throat> and so, thanks to Google, we have this great framework called Flutter. Flutter is an open source framework for build uh, beautiful, natively compiled multi-platform uh, applications from a single code base. Flutter works on all major platforms and processors. It supports ARM and Intel and can run on Windows, uh, Linux, Mac OS, Android, and iOS. Flutter applications also could be compiled to JavaScript to work for web. Uh, Flutter uses Dart as its main programming language. Uh, Dart is an object-oriented, open-sourced, class-based uh, language with C-style syntax. Dart also was developed inside Google. Analyzing of Android Flutter application is quite different from analyzing typ typical Android application, mainly because uh, you need to deal with native code and not Java one. But it is not the only difference. Another uh, side of Dart executable, which is quite annoying, is its separation on runtime environment and Dart program itself. If we look at uh, Flutter Android application, these two parts would be clearly seen as two files, libflutter.so and libpp.so. Uh, the first one is Dart runtime, and the second is Dart program itself. <coughs> also, there is issue with referencing static data in the Dart code. Opening Dart executable in disassembly and trying to find reference most likely won't show you anything interesting. For example, on the screen you uh, can see what we saw when we opened Flu Horse Malware sample for the first time in IDA disassembler. We see the uh, URL of CNC server, but we see no reference to it. So, uh, we see no reference because of uh, such thing uh, that called object pool. Uh, Dart programs use this object pool to access static uh, objects data. Object pool can be imagined as an array of pointers. Every element in this array corresponds to the specific object by object index. So, uh, access to static data is made by Dart program in the following way. To access some object data, we need to know pointer to object pool, and the index of needed object. Uh, with object pool in one hand and object index in another hand, we can fast and easily locate array element that describe data associated with a given uh, object and access uh, the data of the object. Object pool is needed because static data for Dart uh, objects stored in Dart executable in the special serialized format. And when executable loads to memory, this deserialization happens and all the data stored in the heap. But for every launch of same executable, heap could be different. 
That's why we can't uh, store a static pointer to the object's data directly in the executable. And that's when object pool appears and solves the problem. Uh, every object has its own unique uh, index, which is not changed between the launches. So um, during the loading of the executable, Dart runtime creates object pool and stores their pointer to real object's data. Uh, there are quite tools for analysis of Flutter application. Traditionally, there are two approaches, statical and dynamical. Considering all the headache we could have with uh, object pool and pointers, we choose the way of dynamic analysis. Apparently, that all the work beside Frida and Ida could be made with, two, with these two open source guys, Reflutter and Flutter Redema. Uh, Reflutter works the following way. It rebuilds Flutter Android runtime to be able to dump simple information and to sniff network traffic. Uh, the second one with sniffing is not interest, interesting for us, but uh, symbols could be very helpful. And this is the part where runtime packed to separate file helps uh, with us with analysis. Reflutter only touches the Dart runtime file, lib, uh, lib flutter .so, and don't touch uh, the Dart program itself. And the second one is Flutter Redemo project. The main idea of the product project is to dump memory of the running uh, Flutter Android application. And later load those dumps to the IDA disassembler and process it. Both projects are open source and available on GitHub. Uh, so our plan, plan is following. Get the symbols with help of uh, the Flutter project, dump memory of running Flutter application with help of Frida and Flutter Redemo, load and process them to the IDA disassembler, again with help of scripts from Flutter Redema, and then analyze mm, data in IDA. So Flutter run without surprise. We patched and recite the application, run it on test device, and got our symbols. Creating dumps with Flutter Redema uh, also goes as expected. After loading uh, dumps to IDA and process them, we got uh, also symbols, object pool references and data from the object pool, and reference to the data from the object pool. So after all the steps, we go database with the reference and we return to the URL of CNC we spotted before, and there is a reference. Uh, but our happiness didn't last long. It appeared that this was the reference from object pool, and there is still no re reference from code, neither to the string, neither to the object pool record. So we started to dig deeper to understand where the needed reference is. We carefully studied the code of the Flutter demo project. From high level of view, the work of Flutter Redema consists of three parts, dump, load, and process. Dumping and loading goes as it should. So uh, dumps created and loaded to either looks okay. So the troubles must be in the process staging. Process stage divides into three parts also. On the first, uh, the script finds uh, the reference to, job, to the object pool, then it extracts uh, object index and finally creates reference. And this process uh, repeats until all the detected reference will, will be proceeded. Android Flutter application contains variants of same executable for different architectures. We choose to focus on ARM64 variant. Analyzing code of Flutter Redem reveals that object pool record success is found through analyzing of the usage of R27 register. The same information could be obtained by inspecting source code of the Dart SDK. You can see on the screen that code for ARM64 architecture uses R27 as PP. P, PP stands for pool pointer. Uh, so, so inspecting the assembled code, we saw that not all reference to R37 were found and processed by the scripts of Flutter Redemo. You can see that uh, detected reference are marked with a comment. So we started to add support of unrecognized construction for ARM64 one by one. As a result, uh, support of three new constructions were added to the code of Flutter Redemo. Uh, you can see uh, added construction in the red boxes. The one that uh, in the green already was supported by Flutter Redema. Uh, basic approach here was to find and support construction, add its support, run script on the IDA database, again, grab, parse, see what construction are not supported, and added them. 
And we were repeating the steps until we got our reference of interest. Uh, Flutter demo written is quite straightforward. So adding support of new construction is uh, looks like easy peasy. We just need to change or add some regular expression and incorporate some ifs and else to the Python code. And finally, we came to the reference we were looking for. Now we analyze functions that references uh, this uh, CNC URL. Here is an example of one of this function. You can see that uh, endpoint named add content three and two fields. IDs uh, and C4. And finally, after analyzing of all functions that were referenced in the URL, CNC URL, uh, we can say that uh, CNC supports three methods. One for the exfiltrating uh, user uh, login and password. Second, to exfiltrate pay card information. And the third one, to send uh, intercepted SMS messages to the CNC server. Here is an example how does um, packet with uh, intercepted SMS message look like. You can see that it uses HTTP POST method with endpoint add content three and body with two fields, IDs, which is always empty, and C4, which contains the body of the SMS message. Uh, also, data collected by Reflutter, its symbols, was very helpful too. For example, you can see uh, here are two pseudocodes generated by the IDD compiler, one with symbols and another without symbols. I doubt that we were able to spot this method without extracted symbols. What this method do is it registers uh, application as the listener for the incoming SMS messages. So all the improvements we have made to Flutter demo project were composed to pull request and submitted to Flutter demo project on GitHub. Uh, besides adding of parsing new ARM64 construction, we added to Flutter demo some modification to increase convenience of user to it with IDA. We added saving of some uh, important addresses to the one file, so users don't need to enter them by hand while analyzing IDA database. So to summarize, uh, during the research, we detected malware feature several uh, malicious, malicious Android applications that mimic legitimate applications. Uh, most of which were more than one million installs. Also during research we have saw that email of high profile entities were used for the phishing campaign. Uh, the realists invent new technologies hoping for the progress of humankind. Realists adopt this invention to day-to-day -to -day needs, but evil minds abuse them in often unforeseen and predictable way to make the most for them. This leads to the malware sample that can stay undetected for months, making it uh, persistent, dangerous, and hard to spot through it. Also, during this research, several enhancements were made to the open source tools. We are sending big kudos to our colleagues, Sam and Ahad, oh, 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 without whom this research most likely would not happen. If you'd like to get more information, you can Google for keywords you see on the slide or reach our publication on GitHub. Uh, or GitHub pull request. Or you can scan QR code, which will lead to the direct to relevant pages without registration and SMS. Thank you. Thank you. So, where are the questions? No question? Yeah. Almost looked like we covered everything, so no questions to be asked. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, on VirusTotal, this uh, app is still not, not detected. How do you think antiviruses can detect these apps? Uh, now, yes, they can detect this app because we cre <laughs> created signatures for this and the article. Actually, if you know uh, the IOCs, it's pretty, pretty easy to detect. It's, there's no encryption, no some obfuscation, just, just flutter. 
Yeah, we didn't show it in the presentation, but if you check the graphs of uh, those samples that we showed uh, that were like marked with zero detects, now they have, they have some like more than 10 detects, so let's say malicious. Hello, um, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, my question is, Flutter really uh, makes it more difficult to analyze it statically, but <clears throat> does it change anything from the dynamic point of view? Like, does it make it more difficult to, I don't know, um, capture the um, C scores or APIs? Does it make any, any more difficult from this point of view? Uh, well, if I understand your question right, you're asking if it, uh same easy to, um, to sniff traffic in the well dynamic analysis, right? Uh, yes, I'm talking more like automated um, uh, dynamic analysis. So, you know, um, capturing everything that is behavior like uh, interaction with the operating system, uh, opening files, okay, okay. Um, network traffic, uh, all this. Is, uh, is it any more difficult um, for a malware written in Flutter than uh, any other malware written with okay, Java it. plus native? Okay. Actually, no. From the dynamic point of view, you, uh, the analysis of the uh, typical Android application, Flutter, looks pretty much, pretty much the same. Only the difference could be that uh, Flutter network layer uh, don't use system settings for the proxy. It just ignores and uses its own. It only could be issue with uh, sniffing network traffic. But you could use your Flutter for that. Two, three. Okay, thank you.